Vasto Puglisi, president of Cyber Trading University. Most people always focus on the past, where as a professional day trader, we just focus on the future. You can do very well in trading, and you don't have to have a good amount of movement for the stock to go up. Welcome, everybody. My name is Fausto from Cyber Trading, and welcome back for our podcast. Uh, I got my really good friend here, Harry Boxter, from probably one of the He's been around longer than me, actually, and just excited to have him on here. I mean, Harry, thanks for being here. It's been, uh, you know, like we said, we're just talking before that you've been doing a lot of traveling. You got people all over the world, family all over the world, but and you're still doing it. You're still here, yep. helping the community, doing what you love, you know, trading. So that is, that is exactly right, doing what I love. And that's everyone, it. Everyone says to me at your age, and I'm I'm 77. Um, and I've been doing this for over 60 years now. Cause 60 was, years. My years. God. So yeah. how did you, how did, how did it all come about? I mean, like, listen, technology wasn't there 60 years ago. I mean, I got in back, you know, I started in 95. So I'm the newest over 30, over 30 years. So, I mean, how, what did you do? I mean, like we didn't have webinars back then. Did you do a lot of traveling? Did, like, how did you get into it? This is a great story. When I was a young kid, a teenager, I was always interested in, in the stock market. I always read the, I'm a, I'm a, I had this kind of a uh, photographic mind where, uh, where I can look, I look at statistics and numbers. Um, my wife will always say, what's my social security number? And I know it off the top of my head because I just have a, my, a good memory for that. Um, but when I was fascinated by the numbers, when I saw it in the newspaper, the stocks, you know, were up and down, up a quarter, down a half or whatever. And I was watching these things and I was very curious and, so the story goes, when I was 13 or 14, I was up at the Catskills, upstate New York, in a bungalow colony near Greenwood Lake, and, and up near, uh, I think, uh, I forgot the, the big city up there. But uh, the bottom line is, the guy next door to me in the bungalow was a cratchety old stockbroker named Hank Greenstein. And I told him I was very interested in the stock market. He looked at me like, this kids, this is a kid, what does he know, right? He says, come, come over to my place, I want to show you something. So he shows me a book he has of charts that he literally drew by hand. Right. Each day he would put the bar in and draw a line across where it closed. And after a few months, he'd have enough data for a chart. And over a period of weeks and months and years, he would have an actual chart pattern. At that time, there was nothing, no computerized trading, there weren't even computers. I don't think the, the, you know, the, the first PC came out in the early 80s for IBM, I think, had the first PC. Right. Anyway, long story short, there was nothing available. And I was so fascinated by the, by the way the chart patterns were developing. Uh, I started reading a book called uh, Technical Analysis of Stock Trends by Edwards and McGee, now considered the Bible of technical analysis by most people. And that book was written in 1948. And, and, and in ni since 1948, has had 11 editions. Wow. 11 editions where they've revised it slightly for different you know, computers and internet and stuff like that. Anyway, but, but it was amazing to me that the same patterns were good and they were forming the exact same way 50, 60, 70 years later. So basically patterns are, in my opinion, price action uh, depending on human reactions. Meaning if you have, obviously human emotions will push the stock up or knock it down because panic and, and fear and, and FOMO and all of that stuff com comes into play. And that how that's how stock patterns develop. But I found that if, in 1999, this is a, a key, when the market crashed in the dot-com era in 2000. Right. I was trading daily patterns, daily charts. And, but the risk to stay in this market overnight was tremendous. And I decided I'm going to look into patterns intraday and see what that looks like. And so I got down to the point where literally one minute chart patterns is what I use every day now. That's what and I use. Day, yeah. And when I, at one of the trade shows, I ran into Ralph Acampora, uh, who, you know, one of the original elves from Winning on Wall Street with Louis Rukeyser. And another one, by the way, is Mark Leibovitz, who's a close friend of mine. But um, uh, Ralph Akampura was blown away when I showed him at one of the trade shows how he used one-minute charts. He said he didn't think it was possible to trade stocks using intraday patterns and one-minute charts. He said, how could this? But when I showed it to him, he, he was like mind, mind blown. He, mm -hmm. he was completely amazed. Um, and so I decided back in 2001, when I was approached by a guy with a, um, a place, uh, and it, there was an, an, you know, the dot com era, there was all kinds of internet things springing up. One of them was called globalnet.com. And globalnet basically had really intriguing a website on the stock market 
or investments for every country, just about every major country in the world. It was AmericaInvest.com, IndiaInvest.com, EnglandInvest.com, you know, and all over the world. And we went down, the chief editor called me up because he I would refer to him and said, come in my office and let me know. Uh, and, and, and I want to see a little bit about your level of interest and your knowledge in the stock market and, and technical trading. First question he says to me, what do you think of Facebook? I looked at, yeah. I looked at the chart, it was 140. And I said, this stock could double in the next six, eight weeks, the way the chart and the angle of ascent and the powerful volume that's in it. So right. it went from it went from 140 to 206 weeks. He calls me up and says, I want to hire you to write a column for Global Net. Unfortunately, Global Net, six months later, they went down with the dot com. And so he went off on his own and said to me, I, I want you to know that you, your little column in, in our site had more hits than all the other columns combined. And um, I think you know your stuff. Let's start a website together. So we started thetechtrader.com. That was wow. way back in 2001. And I was told by several people that my trading room, which opened immediately in 2001 in July, was the first actual live trading room on the internet. Mm. Now, I, I look back in history and I don't see anybody else that had one before me. So I've been doing it for 23 years, 24 years you know, in that area. And um, you know, subsequently left, went out on my own, um, and my wife, wife and I run our site right now. But it's, this is a um, a really cool site for people that really want to do day trading and swing trading. We, we provide both, uh, you know, ideas. Um, and I uh, find that my picks have been quite accurate over over the years, and have you know a big membership list at this point of. Uh, and some of my, you'd be amazed. I have one lady in particular. It started with me three weeks after we opened in 21. She's still with me. Wow. Yeah. wow. And I have several people 15, 20 years with me. It takes time to kind of get used to somebody. Like I tell everybody, listen, there's a lot of gurus out there. And like I said, I, 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 I had a trading room too. You know, it started back, you know, right around that time when you started too, because the technology was there, finally came up and that's what it was. But uh, yeah, I mean, listen, I have, I have students too, the same way, but it, sometimes it took them probably a few people to listen to before they get onto it. But, you know, getting back to your day trading and swing trading, cause I, that's a specific what I focus on. And I try to tell everyone, Harry, that if you want to be a good swing trader, you got to understand how to day trade first. Cause that's how it turns into a swing trade. It's You're looking amazing. at, I would say 90% of my swings are stocks that started out as day trades. Right. And within, and within, you know, and you look at the five, 15 and, and hourly charts on a day trade, and if they're breaking out across some major resistance levels or out of a big basis and that have taken months or years to develop and they're getting a price volume thrust, that's a phrase that I coined, price volume thrust, meaning it's got to have both price and volume at the same time. Because a stock that has volume but no price or has price action on light volume, to me, are not tradable and, and are too vulnerable and risky. But at the same time, when you get a strong price volume surge uh, on a stock that's breaking out of a major base or a major resistance area, that's often a swing trade for me. And, and you, you know, and that, and that's like, like me, like right now, like we're having a big catastrophe going on with this big hurricane. And like, there's a lot of great day trades that turn into these swing trades. We could talk about them a little bit later, but like, but I, I want to bring something up because like I said, you, I, I was basically very similar being a protege of what you do. And, you know, and the big thing that I always want to ask you, cause a lot of people ask, like if you do a search right now and you, you do a search and like Yvonne asked chat GTP or whatever, and like ask, ask like, what's the, what's the success rate in trading? They'll tell you, it's like, it's a 90% failure rate. It's like, why would you even do it? And then you tell people like, oh, you know, and just like you brought up back in, you know, the com, that was like the biggest market. That's when day trading really took off. Everybody's yes. day trading shops everywhere. You know, I mean, just I can go on and on and on. You know, every single one of them. And I know you did a lot of presentation for them. By the way, I have a great story for you about that end of the dot com, uh, end of the market that uh, you'll love. But anyway, uh, let me know. When, when, no, no, I definitely want to hear it. But my question to you is everyone you bring that up and they do they know that you're a day trader. They all say the same thing. And I'm just right. curious what your comp is like, oh, you're going to lose all your money. That's right. it. Don't even do it. You know, it's a waste of time. And they think it's the most risky to, out of everything. You know, what is, what, how do you, how would you answer that question and tell people here? Cause everybody here is experiencing it right now, you know? So I have an easy answer. The easy answer is the reason why day trading is so risky is because people don't know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, you, you can't, and they don't know how to protect themselves. They don't, the, the, 
Most traders never even heard of a stop loss. It's unbelievable to me when I hear that. Yeah. How, how can you day trade? Uh, first of all, the other thing is technically, I believe there's no way to trade a stock unless you're trading it technically, meaning you're looking at the price, moving averages, trend lines, support, resistance levels. And if you see, and if they're holding and they're moving and they're, and, and they're being confirmed by the underlying technicals, you, your risk reward is much lower. Um, and and if, if you're trading with stops below a certain level, in other words, if you see stocks breaking trend lines, moving averages, and um, uh, price support, perhaps all at once. Why would you stay in that stock? You know why? Because mentally you're saying it'll come back, and it'll come back. More. And they'll not only that, but they'll buy more. And they'll average exactly. Down. They'll average down, which is the second cardinal mistake that you don't do. Two Absolutely. cardinal rules I always tell everyone. Number one, never hold overnights unless it's done into design because that's right. a day trader. And the only reason why they're holding it, like you just said, they don't want to take a loss. And number two, they average down. And then now all of a sudden it becomes an investment. And now and that's how they blow up their accounts. And, but and the, the biggest the biggest winner I ever had in my career, I kept averaging up. And right. I just kept, and it kept multiplying. Not only that, but if you're on margin, which I don't trade anymore. I used to trade when I was a wild cowboy. <laughs> no, heavy duty margin trade. Heavy duty. Uh, and it was great, especially during dot com. You know, that when things were flying. But that the story I was going to tell you is about a stock that I had that basically, you know, it went up. I bought it. I had all this margin power, so I, I just bought some more. Went up, I had some more, but I didn't cost me a nickel to buy more because I got more bu buying power. And when I kept averaging, averaging, averaging until finally one day I put a stop loss in and the stock blew up and blew down and stopped me out. Again, I, I can get into the details, which is a really fun story. Um, but um, th the thing is we talked about is why people fail is they have no semblance of an idea of what technical trading is all about. They don't even know what a price pattern is. They have no idea what trend lines and moving averages are, or what kind of moving averages to use, where to put a stop in. And I tell everybody, when you come into my room, that's my job. I tell you where to buy it. I, I tell you when to buy it, not necessarily exactly what price to buy it, but I will tell you when to get out and where to get out. And, right, and, I right. keep, and during the day, I do something very few people do. I'm online all day with my people. Now my chart is, my charts are always up and you can see me working the trend lines and moving averages and stuff. But when I come on every hour or so, every 45 minutes, and I'll do an update, and, and review the charts with the people. They see what I'm doing, and they learn by my examples. And I was told that being in my room is a, uh, for a couple months is equivalent to two years in a classroom. So how long? Does it take, so how long do you, would you say it takes before somebody knows that they're wasting their time? You know, like I always tell everybody. You know, I want to hear your thoughts on it, but like. There are people like, like I would train that not I would train them. I would talk to them because I, we interview everyone we teach, you know, because listen, you know, and I know a lot of people really don't qualify to trade. And there's a lot of reasons why it's like, you know, going to the doctor or whatever it is. And we can go on and on with that, you know, like you're qualified to do it or not. But like, there are people like would be on demo mode for a year. And I'm like, like, what? Like a year? You should be on no more than two you, weeks. I mean, when you say demo mode, you're talking about uh, uh, what, paper, what about trading. paper trading. Paper trading. The paper trading, you know what I mean? Like when, when would you say to somebody, you know, it's time to move on. Maybe, you know, it's not your style or maybe you don't have the right person. Like what would you, what would your advice to them? Well, the, the, the funny thing is, is, if you're listening to what I'm telling you, you don't have to move on. You just keep making money. Uh, but if you, and, and the purpose of being in my room is not just to make money, but to learn how to trade. That's what I tell everybody. Right. And it's funny because every once in a while I'll, I'll have a long-term subscriber who um, says to me, um, uh, I, I may I may be leaving for a while to trade on my own, and I say why? Because I've learned so much from you, I can do it on my own now. I don't need I don't need the community. Some people don't like the community. Uh, the other people love the community because they can interface with each other. In my room, you can send private messages to each other and interact with that, and with anybody. And so that it's, and, and me too as well. You can send me a private message. Uh, right. If you, at the time, I'll answer you. Um, so uh, what I'm thinking is that a couple months of paper trading, Max, you'll, right. know, well, you'll, right. know whether you, you, well, you'll know whether you're good or not. I also think that people don't know how to allocate trading. If you have a $100,000 paper trading account, you don't put all your money in one basket. Mm -hmm. I, to me, it's three to four stocks max at any one time because you want to be manageable. You want to be able to watch them carefully and closely, especially if it's short-term trading. If there's swing trading, that's a different story. Uh, but you still, I have a, I, I put out webinars every night called Charts of the Day, where I go over all the active stocks that day that we were watching or trading. I also do a swing trade. Every week I do a video that's called the Weekly Swing Trade Review, where I go over all the swing trades. I show them technically how they changed, 
where the support resistance of targets are and tell them where to raise their targets to or raise their stops to or exit the position because it's been stopped out or that type of thing. So I just really feel like if you're disciplined and focused, those are two things, discipline and focus. Focus means you can't have, you cannot be focused on too many stocks at once. I don't care how great or how quick your mind is. Uh, oh, looks like we just lost him for a sec. He'll be back, everybody. Oh, there you are. Okay. So <clears throat> what I was saying was focusing on three or four stocks max, um, even if you're swing trading. Um, I think uh, uh, I, the other part, part of that philosophy is would you rather have 10 stocks and 1,000 shares or would you have, rather have four stocks and you know 40,000 shares or whatever you whatever the amount is? I believe in uh, liquidity and I believe in leverage. And I think one of the things, what, one of the reasons I like trading lower price stocks, when I say lower, I'm talking about uh, anywhere in the four or five range up to 40 or 50. That's to me lower. Uh, but in my room every day, because I notice a lot of people who like to trade higher price stocks, I'm literally always putting out stocks at 100, 200, 250, Today I put out... Uh, uh, a $300 stock and it went up 10 points. Now it doesn't sound like a lot, but for people who want that kind of liquidity and volume tra trading on a stock, um, a higher price stock is, 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 is best. But you always have to ask yourself, Fausto, what kind of trader are you? Do you like the lower price stocks? Uh, are you comfortable with NASDAQ 100? Are you comfortable with S&P 500 stocks? Are you comfortable with two, $3 stocks? Because a lot of these go double and triple in one day, as you know. Uh, but there is, but the next day they're down 100% or 50%, whatever they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a short squeezes sometimes. Yeah, I call them the pop and droppers or, or you know, or pump the and uh, pump, pump, pump and dumpers. Yeah. And it's always in biotech and high tech. Always. It's amazing. Or Chinese stocks <laughs> that, that you know, you, when they open, the next day they run, they're up 300% on 40, 50 million shares when they've never traded more than 400,000 a day. You know what I mean? That type of thing. You know, pretty much that within two or three days, they're back down substantially. So that's why I always tell people, you cannot trade these stocks without a stop loss. If you don't right. know where it is, ask me. Because I always, and every trade that I put out every morning, I put out the, the, the symbol, the targets, at least two, and, and the support levels and the stop levels. So that there's no excuses. It, I, I hate when someone says to me at the end of the day, I bought it at three and it's down to two. What should I do with it? I said, my stop was two and three quarters. You know, <laughs> and you're still in it? And you know, now you're on your own, basically. What am I supposed to do with someone who doesn't listen, doesn't have focus, and it is not disciplined? That's how you lose your money. When you're not disciplined. Yeah, it, it, what happens, yeah, Harry, I, I say the same thing to people. When they lose X amount of money, sometimes they can't afford to lose that much. Like, I can't take a loss like this. And then that's how it spills into, you know, a bigger and 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 worse loss. And that's, and that's, and that's something. And you know what? I tell everyone it's not a bad thing. I tell everybody, listen, losing money is actually a good thing. If you know why you lost, you're not going to do it again. You know, right. you don't need to, listen, you're going to go on a bicycle. You're going to fall. You know, you're going to, the whole idea is you get up, you eventually get on. I mean, like I tell, and like, listen, you like, you had some young ones and you know, it's like dry, teaching kid, I drive a car for the first time. You know how dangerous mm -hmm. a car is, but it's the most mm -hmm. the scariest thing right. in the world. I'm like, oh my God. I like, you know, you get thrown in a parking lot, but right away they'll catch on right away. And that's one of the biggest issues that I see. So, but what what is the most common mistake that you that you try to teach your students to avoid? You know, like I mean, well, do like, it. So number, long, I mean, there's two or three things. Number one, over trading. Over trading. Over trading. Meaning they, uh, like for example, it's, you go to Vegas and you win the first pot, and you win a lot of money, and then you right. just you up your your up your ante, and you can't keep trading until you lose all your money. Um, in, in the stock market, the, the thing to do is. You got to be disciplined and focused, but you got to know when to sell. You got to know when to hold them, when to fold them. Uh, right, and I think right. most, most people, and the number one question I get, Fausto, which is really amazing to me, is I bought the stock at two and went up to two and a half, and here it is at five. How do I stay in the trade? These people see a profit and they jump on it, right? They're not willing to be disciplined and focused and hold on to it. Watch the chart, see if it's holding support, if it's continuing to trend up, if it's going up at a 45 degree angle and it's holding its support levels. And, and moving averages and trend lines, stay with it. There's no reason to sell a stock until it does one of two things. It reaches your target or it gets stopped out. Mm -hmm. That's the only, only time to sell a stock. Reach your target, exit, or it's stopped out. The, the third, now there is a third. It's that at the end of the day, you keep going. 
just it's pretty funny that uh, one of the Samuel on YouTube is just basically saying he's like he's like hearing like a double voice because like everything that you say is what I basically preach. And the only reason why we know we, we're very similar, and that's why I loved having you on, is because you know that's why we've been around for so long. I mean, you know, great traders trade very, very similar, you know, maybe have a little bit of a style, you know, a little bit different. Like I, I focus more on high frequency trades, the algorithms, you know, like I read the right of the chart, not the left. I look at the orders out there, you know, I see where big block orders are. Um, but a lot of Let it is, by the way, if you look, if you look at my screen, every morning that I, I show, I have two screens. One is my market minder screen and they right. have six NASDAQ level two boxes on them of six of the stocks we're trading. So if they can see the bids they ask and the volume at, at the bid and they ask. So even though I don't do it the way you do, um, I do watch them closely because if I see big bids on, under a stock that's about to break out, um, um, I'm, I'm, I may run it before they do. Uh, so you're I'm, a little bit more of a tape reader, would you say? Uh, yeah, well, it's a funny story. When I was 19, I used to cut classes from Fairleigh Dickinson University back in Jersey, where, <laughs> where, where, where I grew up. I would go to my broker's office and sit in the front Watch that big tape go by with all these retired guys that were in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. And I'm a 19 year old kid in college, and I'm saying, short, short syntax. <laughs> it would go, where did you get this kid? Where did he come from? And and the syntax went down 45 points in a day and a half after that. And and that's when they broke. This is a great story. The manager of their office came over to me and said to me, "What's your story?" And I told him. And he said to me, "When you're done with college, come see me. You have a job." So that's how it started out in the brokerage business. I was a broker for about six, seven years, but each firm hired me as their technical analyst. Okay. I was, doing, I was writing a market letter for them called the Trader's Corner at the time. Um, and that, then I went to school and got, got into executive recruiting. I had a headhunting firm for 40 years in LA, the n number one firm in Los Angeles. But I, I sold that to my partners and focused on uh, what I'm doing now, which I love doing. I get up, by the way, every morning at 3.30 a.m. Wow. Well, you're in California too. Some right. people don't realize that you're all on the West Coast, and which I, I, I mean, listen, you know what? For a guy that's, did you say 77? <laughs> you look like you're 57 for crying out loud. So, what do you, well, what are you, you doing? Oh, thank my you. God. You look great for your age, you yes. know? And, and so, um, it's more, it's not so much how I look, it's my energy level, which is, I think, uh, I, everyone I talk to says, I know guys 25, 30 years old, they don't have your energy. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, but I am a type A guy, which makes me a lousy golfer. <laughs> there you go. Um, but, uh, you know, be, be getting back to trading, I just didn't really feel that, that the reason why people lose money for the most part is they're unfocused and undisciplined. Undisciplined, right. Right. It's about 80, 90 okay. percent. Uh, 80, 90 percent, you know, is part of trading. Like I tell everybody, like we have people that come on my show, you know, talk about options. They talk about futures. And it, it, it all comes down to the same thing. It's all about, you know, psychology, discipline and so on. You can't let the things take advantage of you. Um, and you just can't, you know, you, you can't take it personal. That's what, that's another thing. People take things uh, personal. Uh, 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 and here's the other thing. If you're an emotional person or a type A person like I am, it takes a longer time to learn. You have to right. not only learn about the market, you got to learn about yourself. I right. The, because if you're too emotional, you tend to jump, you tend to be unfocused and undisciplined. Right. It took me a long time to learn that. Yeah. And they say, uh, it's, it's a, believe it or not, Learning how to do technical analysis and trade successfully is a 15, 20 year process. I am not kidding. That's why I say to people, don't expect to come in, think you're a genius and do it on your own. It's much better to be in a room like yours or mine where we guide them and teach them as they go and um, and, and give them the discipline and focus that they need. Um, and so uh, I really feel like you, l learning about technical analysis is number one, the key. And then learning about yourself is the second key. Uh, you got it from the in, internal uh, looking yourself in the mirror and say, can I do this? And do I have the stomach for it? Because it takes a, it, my, my, my buddy, uh, my ex, a good close up friend of mine who's a great trader used to say, it takes a cast iron stomach and two breaths. You know what? <laughs> well, you, you, you know, Harry, being around for all these years, you know, I, I like to ask a question about the future, right? Sure. So, I mean, like you've seen, you've been around through so many catastrophes, like I've been. I mean, my biggest catastrophe, my first one was the internet bubble back in 2000. And I tell everyone, if you could just survive one catastrophe, you'll survive as a trader forever because you, you're going to get into bad positions. You got to know how to survive. And you just got to be patient, not get emotional. Where do you see the market going now? I mean, like with AI and, and all this stuff. I mean, like, listen, you and I are a little more old fashioned. I mean, I'm, I'm 53 now. I mean, like even... 
I'm a dinosaur in this industry. You get a lot of you, you, like you, there's so like listen, you deal like I deal. There's so many people out there that, that are now have followings. You look at people on YouTube and they have like five million followers and they only been in the business for two years. And like and I always try to tell people, be very careful of those people. I mean, you know, they never well, been I, I, you are so on the money with that. Um my, my wife and I talk about this all the time. It's amazing how many people are out there advertising, spending 10, 15, 20,000 a month on advertising just to get people in. But the, but the, can they keep them? Probably not. But the, but their philosophy just keep them coming in, you know, and so keep the money coming in. But they're not really doing these people a favor. Uh, they're right. not the kind of they're not the kind of seasoned, focused, reliable people that you can for, first of all rely on, rely on on them be, being more accurate and being um, profitable enough for you to be able to afford to be there. You know, and it's not a lot. I'm sure you don't. I don't have. In front of me, what it costs to be in your your room or my mine, but it's not a very expensive proposition. I have, I have people coming in telling me that during the trial period, and by the way, today we're offering a twenty day free trial to all your all your uh, listeners. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll post that link everyone to come and join and join his trade room, so you guys can get a little bit and know what Harry uh, what he talks about, and absolutely. And, and I think the most important thing I want to put, as long as we're talking about it, come in the room before the market opens. The pre market focus list and a pre-market discussions that I have with my people is tantamount imperative. You must be there. You must be able to listen to what's going on, how I create my focus list, why I create my focus, what, what stocks go on there, how I, what my criteria is, that type of thing. And then during the course of the session, which ones we eliminate and why, and the new ones we add on that come in after the market opens, because a lot of stocks aren't revealing any movement pre-market, but they'll pop after the market opens and run all day. Those, mm -hmm. We want to catch those too. So, um, yeah, so you have to, um, you have to be there early. You have to be the early bird catches the worm in my room. It's very true. <laughs> I said early bird gets the trade, <laughs> but, there you go. But, but what do you, but what do you, you know, getting back to my question before, what do you, where do you see the market going? Like you seen anything evolving or what yeah. you should be looking for? Like, yeah. you know, anything yeah. has a change that you're going to see that might help in, in trading or. Well, I mean, uh, obviously AI is big now, um, I'm, but I'm old school. And I, I also think. You know, the, maybe I'm crazy, but I think that I can outbeat any AI trade. Mm. Okay, that's it. Because I I know what I'm doing. I know the patterns that develop. I have an instinctive feel for things that you, that that you don't necessarily get uh, from computers. But at the same time, it's a viable tool. If you can combine that with what you, your your knowledge and my knowledge is, you should be very successful. Um, I, I think the future holds. That, that like just like I said, technical analysis of stock trends by Edwards and McGee. That book was written in 48, 1948. Okay, it's like 75 years later. Those patterns still hold true. AI is not going to change anything. Automated trading is not going to change anything. The patterns that develop are going to are going to develop because human beings are involved. Okay, now there's a lot of automated trading, but they trade based on the same things that are developed in human minds. That's how they develop AI. So I just really think that, think that. It may be a useful tool, um, and I don't poo-poo it. Uh, but that may be uh, you know, automated trading, uh, um, institutional trading, very, very big. But all the years of institutional trading, which has now increased to, what, 60 or 70% of trades on exchanges are institutional, that doesn't change anything in terms of my patterns or the way um, I've been successful in, in giving my people successful stock trades every day. Do you remember, remember the old days, the black boxes? Remember that we were talking about they had an automated system. These people, these people build these algorithms, these boxes, and they automatically traded. I always think of like, you know, and like I know a lot of people in the brokerage, the brokerage firms, trading firms, and yeah. they always came up to me, Harry, and they're like, they say, you know what? I got this new guy that came up with this new box. And you know, yeah. it's working for like it's gonna work for probably a yeah. week, but then yeah. they don't realize that that they don't realize that Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, BlackRock, they have, they're looking for those black boxes and they'll, and eventually they'll read the algorithm and they'll trade against them. And then obviously it doesn't work anymore. They find that formula. The, the difference between, I feel AI and so on. Yeah. I love AI. I use it every day and it's, it's here to stay. But like you just mentioned, what is part of trading? It's 80% emotion. You know, AI has no emotion. It doesn't understand, you know, feelings or, you know, understand, you know, eh, things don't seem right. You know, like you're in danger, you know, it has to kind of learn it. And eventually, you're competing with someone else out there, and they're going to these other brokerage firms are going to have other AIs going to fight against other AIs. So that's what you're saying. Like you're like me, I'm a little old fashioned too, you know, where it comes into it. And you and you don't got to kill it, you know. I mean, listen, you got to put some work into it. You can't put this stuff on cruise control, 
You know what I mean? Like GPS is great. You know what I mean? But like you sit there and (laughs) I still feel freaked out about the whole Tesla automatic drive, but like you're still going to want, you know, you still got to pay attention. All right. What's going on? Right. And and here's the other thing. You're never too old to learn something new, right? Um, uh, I'm constantly reading and looking and updating my my skill sets. People say to me, for example, I don't use candlesticks. I've been training bar charts since, since I'm a kid. And it's successful, very successful. Mm-hmm. Why would I need to learn something new and and mucky up the the uh, the universe with my universe? I also am a big believer in, you know, there's 85 or 100 technical indicators out there. Uh, I use half a I use a half a dozen. If you see my chart, it's got three moving averages, a VWAP, and and on the bottom it has a, a couple of technical indicators. Uh, you know, like uh, uh, like well, I, I use TC2000. I use some of their indicators that indicate overbought, oversold, and uh, and and. Uh, and that type of, and accumulation distribution. That's not all I believe is necessary. Well, you know, Harry, that's great. I'm glad you, you I, I'm glad that you actually said that because I want to sway into and showing everybody your chart and exactly what you're looking at. Maybe you can show people a little bit about your style and what you do differently because we do very trade very, very similar, you know, day trading and more on the swing trading part about it. But like, you know, getting back to about the indicators, like you said, yeah, they're, they're, they're not hundreds, they're thousands. And then you could hear, all these different people, and one person will tell you why his it, his chart is a better indicator, candlestick better than him, and his better than his. And, and next thing you know, you're confused, and you're not even going to trade. You know, at the end of the day, you got to hit the button, right? It's all about the kiss method. I tell her and keep it super simple, and just you know, and just get into it because I should kiss me, keep it simple, stupid. Yeah, stupid. <laughs> I, that's the right way of saying it. I'm trying to be being nice about it. But show, yeah, definitely show me a little bit about you know. Let's see, let's show everybody a little bit about what, what your your style of trading and how you found your, the volatile momentum stocks and and how you're seeing them and how you use your indicators. So if you could uh, you know, share, you know, like I said, share your screen. There you go. Well, uh, can you see my chart now or no? Yeah, perfect. You can you can see it. Yep. Okay. And here's a couple of positions. Now, this morning I came in and I put this on my focus list. Why? Because it popped, coiled, popped and coiled. And I said, if we get a fifth wave. Now, basic Elliott wave stuff, you have to learn that. But it usually occurs in five waves. One, two, three, four, and there's a fifth wave. So I came in in the morning and I looked at this chart. And the way to look at it, uh, uh, Fausto, the best to look at it is to do this. Go back in time. This is the best teaching method you can do. I came in this morning. And the stock looked like this, okay? And I said, if it pops this line right here and it goes above the VWAP, which at the time was three, let's see, 319. I said, over 320 with volume, we're going along. Now check this out. Within a couple of minutes, it popped and it formed a little wedge and popped again. So literally went from a three to 410 in about 10 minutes. It was a great trade for our traders, and I told them to sell half their position. But look what happened. It went up to 550, and we sold the rest. You know, it's funny. We were trading that stock this morning. Yeah, so did we. HDRX. I had a great yeah, move from it. Then, it did, and Fausto, then it did this. and it, We call that a falling wedge. But I said, if it holds this zone, it may be a snapback opportunity. But it's already had five waves. The risk-reward to me wasn't worth it. Why? Because it went from 190 to 550. And it, you know, you're talking about almost a triple. And when it moves that quickly, what we did was sold half here, watched the bounce, put a stop under there at 460, and we're stopped out right there. What did it do subsequently? That's where it is now. So yep. that was a good trade because we averaged out at five. It's down at under four. Um, and so, you know, but that's one of the ways we trade. And this was the telltale. Every morning I come in, I look for a pop and a flag, a pop and a wedge. Again, go back, going back in time. See this little wedge in here? Uh huh. Notice the volume. Actually, that Fausto flag. Oh, you look at the chart. I'm looking at more of the candle, how it was flagging, where you have right. consolidation going on there. Yep, it's exactly what we saw. Same exact thing. It's so yeah, scary. Yeah, it's, it's funny because my friends always call it the boxer flag. <laughs> All right. Uh, we call that we call it the Fausto flag. Everybody, we look at those. Anyway, you can see you can see that the wedge. Uh-huh. As, soon as, as soon as it popped, it went vertical. Mm-hmm. Another example, Saba. This morning, I came in. Pre-market, oh, Saba. Saba exploded. 
Yeah, I did. I saw that we were on that. We were on that one too. It's so funny. You're the same stocks. Yeah, and then when it broke out right there, we put a, a buy on it, and my targets were at 29, 31. It hit 29, it hit 31, 23. So we all got out. You see where it is now, 28 and change. Yeah, once I made what's called, uh, when it hit that high at 31, we call that a higher low, and that's when it started just breaking down. And the other thing is when I see a stock make, you know, trending like that and then pulling back, immediately I say, okay, if, for those of you who sold half here, Stop is here. If it goes higher, great. If it doesn't, you're stopped out at 30. There it is. 28.37. So mm. <clears throat> why stops are so useful, obviously, it's to save save you, you know, save your profits. Um, if you sold it at 31 and changed, like I told you, and stopped out at 30, so your average is 30 and a half, and now you're two points lower. LASE, same thing here. Going nowhere. It popped and pulled back and formed the coil. And I said to my people, we, we break the coil with any energy. And energy to me is volume. 331,000 shares on a breakout there at about five. And an hour later, it's 690, 40% trade almost. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then where was the stop? I'd have to stop around there. The VWAP is there. This little, these bottoming areas in here. Um, so it can't plunge right to it. And it's right there now. If it cracks, it cracks. If it goes up, and this is a one, two, three, four, it may be a, um, a truncated fifth wave or maybe a one, two of five. And then we go three, four, five. That remains to be seen. Another one, Capricorn. Now, this is a beauty. Yeah, Capricorn. Um, when, it, when, it popped, when it popped and formed that flag, I said, if it breaks the flag, we're going in. At 19, it, it crossed it. An hour and a half later, not even an hour and a half, 19 to 2147. And by the way, it's still in play because it hasn't broken support yet. What about um, did you see Hood this morning? We were trading that. That was doing pretty well too. I saw it, but I, you know, here's the thing, Fausto. Um, I'm like a kid in the candy shop. I'm a very high energy hyper kind of guy. <laughs> so, so so I, I want to and, and I want to be in every stock or I want to show everybody every stock that's running because I don't want to miss the big runner. Okay. But at the same time, it's a problem for most people. You don't know how to focus. So of late, yeah. I've been limiting it to six to eight stocks, and then I'll give guidance on a couple, three more. But I'll, that's all it is. It's not a recommendation. It's just guidance for you in case you're interested. But at the same point, at some point, you have to say, that's it for now. Let's follow what we have and keep focused. And that's what I try to do. Um, in the case of Capricorn, um, I had my target was 20 and 21, and we reached 21 and a half. So both of those targets were met. But if you take a look at the way you have to, this is what you have to do during the course of the day. Your trend lines have to change. Your angles of ascent will change. So your trend lines need to change too. For me, now, now, Cap, just to bring it up, now you bring it up, because we've been trading that stock for the past week. That thing was $4. I mean, literally, you know, just the ending of September. And I I, yeah, so like the, the question, and that's what I was trying to say, we were talking about earlier. How do you, be, you're looking as a day trade, but this stock turned into a swing trade, you know, and it's still a day trade, a day trade for the day, but it's been a swing trade. How do you how do you focus in somebody like a stock like Capper and say, okay, listen, you know, we're day trading it today if you missed at it, but some people probably still have it as a swing trade. How do you veer one versus the other? Like well, it, in my room, some, sometimes I'll put in uh, this is rare, but I may put in a day trade and a swing. For example, in, in Capricorn's case, if you take a look at this long base that it developed over like three, four years, right? When it broke out here with a breakaway gap and then had another gap and pulled pull back. Right. I said, if it doesn't, you know, once it filled that little mini gap here, I, I don't think it's going to fill that gap. It's just too powerful. Um, and it started to run. This is when we put the trade on. That was a day trade. It went from 10 to 14 in one day. And now two days of consolidation, it's kind of flagging in here. If you go to a 15-minute chart, excuse me. Yeah, sometimes you got to do a 15-minute chart because it kind of yeah. it, it doesn't make it so... It gets a different perspective on it too. Yeah, it doesn't make it doesn't seem doesn't it almost gets away turning into a a, a line chart. The problem I have with this chart is that it's one, two, three, four, five waves already, but the fifth wave and this is always tough to, to determine could be a one, two, and three, four, five. So a fifth of a fifth is where I always sell. So my projection is thirty-one two. If it breaks out over today's high, I'll say over twenty-one and a half. It could just fly into the mid channel around 25 upper channel around 31 32 
So, uh, but at the same time, where would you stop the stock? You have to stop under that line. Not only is that a, there a trend line there, but there's a lateral price support and a moving average, the 50 day, which I follow, so a fit or 50 period. By the way, these trend lines for everybody's watching, your moving averages are 10, 21, and 50 day, and there's also a VWAP. But, so those are the four things I watch intraday along with trend lines, moving averages, and um, price resistance. You see this here? Yep. This is four, three days ago. You can get this above 22, 21.98 is the high. You can see there's no overhead resistance. So it's, it's the kind of stock that has what, what most traders call blue skies. And, and it will absolutely, most of the time, spike and blow into the, this could very well be a 25 to $28 stock in the near term <laughs> if it breaks out. Where's the discipline? Stop underneath 17 and a half. You have to. Now, if you want to be tighter than that because it's too far away, go to a 15 minute chart, look at the pattern, and, and then even closer, five minute chart. And now here, here's your intraday support levels. It's so funny how you see how clean you get to see it. And, and then, you know what, that I'm great. I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, I kind of show that also. And I think people neglect, they don't realize that sometimes you have to, it's like a bigger, it's a different perspective by blowing it out a little bit different by changing the bars to see a little bit more, but you, you're doing it right. I mean, like you're looking at the one, you always start with the one minute and then when right. it gets started again, a little messy, then you know what? Then you start bringing. You go take a step back. You've got a five or fifteen. You're like, okay, now you can see a little bit more cleaner. Those well, I always tell everybody. I always tell everyone else that that if you want it, are considering swing trading it, look at the waves. See how many waves it's had. And if it, the best way to swing trade a stock is after it does the first big thrust and pulls back. That's where I put most of my swings out. Mm -hmm. I think I did that in Capricorn. I'll have to check out my numbers. But this one went from nine to twenty-three, and it did it. It did it in six, seven days. Okay, yeah. um, uh, as you as you can see, so sometimes you catch catch the tiger by the tail. Um, but if if you want to be disciplined, you got to know where to sell them. In my opinion, because it's gone up so far so fast, and then went from eighteen to twenty two, that's where you got to tighten your stops a little bit. And let's see what comes up here. Do you always put stops out? Uh, I, on every trade, I tell them we where to stop. stop. But I will maybe during the day say when the stock is run, and I'll see a, a different support level after it breaks out. For example, if this broke above here and went into 23.4, then the support would be this breakout point. And because support, resistance becomes support when broken, and support becomes res, a resistance when broken. So simple as that. When, once you break, like for example, see this prior high here? Uh huh. It broke through it, it came down, bounce, 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 but never got below that. That prior high was support and these highs here. That's why I drew this line. That's why I always draw lines above the tops and bottoms, resistance and support. So in this case, the big, big stop has to be under 17 and a half because it could collapse on you. I and mean, any stock that goes from four to 23 could easily go under 17 and a half on a pullback. So that's a must stop. But I would put two stops in. This is how another thing. People, Fausto, do not, they're emotional. So they make a decision and they act on it. Why sell everything or buy everything all at once? Why not sell in tranches? Why not buy in tranches? Well, in, in meaning, if this stock broke below that zone, below 19 and a half, 20, sell half. If it broke, because if it turns around and goes up, you still have half, half your position, and you could always add the other half back that you stopped out on. If it breaks below here, then your second stop is here. Obviously, if it breaks below 17, three quarters, 17 and a half, the trend is broken, everything's broken, and you should be out of the stock. Now, if you stop here and there, you average out about 19, Stock went down to 15 or 16. It's still a good stock. Okay, uh, you may not have, have optimized your profit by selling it up here, but you know if, if you want to stay in the stock, the way to stay in it is to keep stops at different levels, and don't stop or sell everything all at once. Same thing with buying. You want to buy when a stock, for example, broke out here. Add to it there. If it breaks out above here, add to it there until the stock blows off in a fifth wave, or Rolls over and takes out a stop. Really, the only two times you need to sell a stock is when it goes too far too fast and blows off, or right. rolls, rolls over and takes out a stop. Those are the two selling rules. There's, um, I'm looking at my end. There's a, it's not too many shares, but 
you got a big uh, big iceberg order, a bunch of orders sitting there at 22, and a lot of them, a lot of them sitting between 25 and 26. I see a lot of a lot of big sellers sitting there right at those resistance levels. Uh, yeah, going go back on the fourth, you could see that it's they're pretty, basically been out there since the fourth. So at that 22 that you pointed out, that's a big resistance. So, yeah. but uh, yeah, well, I mean, also, the, the, here's something else. And I always caution everybody. The most overused term and the most overused pattern in Wall Street, you know what it is? It's a head and shoulders. Because <laughs> it, it, I'll, I'll, I would tell you this, 25% of head and shoulder patterns turn out to be head and shoulders. You know what they really are? They're this. What, what is this? Left shoulder, head, right shoulder? No. It's a coil or a wedge until it breaks down. It's not a head and shoulders until the neckline breaks. If it breaks the neckline, then you can do your counts down support there support there support there wherever but the point being is that um you could they always yeah, it's amazing how head and shoulder patterns always turn out to be wedges and the stock goes higher yeah that's that's the old way people call heads and shoulder teacups and uh handles and stuff like that they use we just call it more of just a higher low or lower high you know depending on it's just breaking uh where it's going but yeah those heads and shoulders peaks and valleys you know there's always this fancy name that people always come up with and always say yeah, here's, here's one we caught right, right from the get-go, and I said to people, it backs off. Didn't back off much, and then it fell apart. So that, that's why you have to maintain a discipline. See this pullback low and this pullback low? There's your mm -hmm. stop right there. It was stopped out at 54. It went down at 50, and it's rallied back to 54. <coughs> then on the day, it's up 6.5 points or 13%. It's a pretty good stock. Interesting. And always look at the daily pattern, too. Check out the breakout. This is actually should be a swing trade. Because it broke out through four or five tops, spent mm -hmm. nine months in a base pattern, and now what does it do? It pulled back to the breakout point. That's a buying opportunity. A lot of times you'll pop and drop and then go again. It, all, all this, you see that all the time. That's right. This is a retest right now. Farmers, uh, the, 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 you know, it's funny. There's a lot of stocks and pharmaceutical stocks I do. They all trade a lot on the NASDAQ side, but they've been doing great. But, you know, um, I know well, just a really quick. Uh, want to kind of just bring something up with you because with your experience i know we spoke about this last time you've been through a lot of catastrophes like we i've been through and stuff like that and um and my question harry is um what i want to ask you is when it comes to what's happening right now i mean listen we're going through an election year we got hurricane that's going to hit florida really bad you got um i mean you got a war in iran yeah i, I you know in you know in, in um israel and stuff like that how do you prepare and the market's really it's breaking all time highs. I mean, we're at forty two thousand for crying out loud. How, what do you advise? What, what do you what do you, what are you looking at? And where do you, how do you, would you trade this market? I got an, an easy answer. Joe, do you remember the name Joe Granville? Yes. Joe Granville back in the sixties and seventies uh, had half a million subscribers. I'm not kidding. And he used to move the markets. But his favorite phrase was, "The market climbs a wall of worry." The market discounts the future six to nine months in advance. But the market's telling me now is, and I may be wrong, that uh, after all of this blows over, the economy becomes robust and um, profits are still good and, and stocks will march higher. However, are we long-term overbought? Do major Elliott Wave people like my buddy Avi Gilbert, Elliott Wave trader, think the market is um, topping here in a, in a major generational type top that could have a bear market of five to 10 years. That's what he thinks. Uh, I don't care what anybody thinks. I listen to, it's trade what you see, not what you think. So I always look at the charts every day and say to myself, the market's going down, the market's going up. I don't care about the noise. I don't care about, you know, it's amazing how often you'll have war, you'll have all these negative pieces of news, the interest rates, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the market will <laughs> gap up or gap down and go in the opposite direction and, and trend for a few days. It, it, this is what the public does. They get sucked in. They listen to, to fundamentals while the technicians are looking at the technicals and they're, and they're, bu they're buying the uh, breakouts and the, the pullbacks to support a low volume and that type of thing. Institutional traders trade 50-day moving averages. I don't know if you know that. I talked to dozens of them. Just about everybody, when a stock pulls back on a daily chart to a 50-day moving average and bounces, that's when they go in. There's a great book out there, Fausto, called Monster Stocks by a guy named John Boyk, B-O-I-K. It's amazing to me how this guy put this book together, but he found all the major winners of the of the last 10 decades, going back 100 years, 
and he showed the charts and he showed where institutional, he said that, you know, um, Goldman Sachs bought here and Morgan Stanley bought here and Fidelity bought here and every one of those, and I don't know where he got that information, but it, it, you can see that they all bought on the pullback to the trend lines and moving averages on the, on the 50 day moving average on a rising channel. And so um, there's basic stuff that you need to know every day when you're trading. And I think the, the, the way to do it is the technical end. And I think most people don't have a clue about technical analysis. And when they do, they think they do. It takes years of applications uh, to really learn how to be a real good technical trader. And that's why I kind of tell everybody, it's just a lot easier to understand the concept if you day trade and understand what happens over the course of the day. That's how like the swing trades and the indicators come in because indicators are laggers, right? They basically, they follow the trend, what happened, what happened in the past. And that's how you kind of like, understand okay now i understand why this indicator is doing like you said like the 50 moving average is a really popular one some people think it's a 200 moving average you know people use so can you see my market minder right now uh yeah we'll put up right here absolutely so this is what i have every day you see this the six boxes that are up there that's the yep. nasdaq that's a nasdaq level two and when i'm trading stocks i always uh i always put out my top six so they can follow them and they, they can see where the bids and ass are but also the five minute charts for the NDX on the left and the S&P on the right. Uh -huh. and, then, and then I have the hourly charts for the same on both. Mm -hmm. and, when I'm, and when I'm doing my webinars, I'm showing my people this um, all day so they can get an idea of where the patterns are. Note, by the way, on the S&P 500, we're right up against a declining tops line and near what looks like the top uh, of a right shoulder. If you look at this as a left shoulder, triple top head and right shoulder, there's your neckline right down there. Mm -hmm. until, the until the market breaks down underneath that, this could very well be nothing more than a big wedge before we go much higher. My projections are 58, 58, 50, maybe 59. Um, I'm not, I wouldn't be shocked if the market went to 6,000 in a blow off. That wouldn't shock me uh, at all. Uh, but, but below this line, I think we come down here and maybe a lot lower. So there, again, I come in every day, I look at the charts and I say, don't focus on the market. Are you trading the market? Are you trading the S&P futures? No, you're trading individual stock patterns. The mm -hmm. biggest mistake, Fausto, that I ever made personally and that I know many of my French traders made is when they reacted on their stock in terms of buying and selling based on what the market was doing. I do. Big mistake. Big mistake. Big, I, you know what? I say the same thing. People look at me like, you know, the, the market's up. Uh, like yesterday it was down and and, I, and I'm long um, Lowe's and Home Depot and, uh, and, and Generac because of the hurricane going in. They all, they're all up, but the market took a hit. I'm like, if, if that was the case, they'll go down. They, they, they're trading totally separate. They have nothing to do with what's going on. They're totally different. Just like Lace and Sava, you know, um, only certain stocks will trade with the market. But that's where people get themselves caught up. But, um, yeah. but uh, Harry, you know what? Before we go, uh, just really quick. Ooh, what happened here? I just want to get this up. Right? Uh, before we go, Harry, just one really quick question. So, um, you know. Be doing it for a long time, and obviously, we're gonna anyone that's listening, dude, you're gonna get the highlights of this video and and and, and the webinar and stuff like that. What advice could you give somebody like you know to 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 in, enhance their education? Is there a book? Is there a movie that you always recommend? Something that just something simple, just to even someone that's just starting out. I mean, what, yeah. what, what would be the advice for you well, to always do it? I mentioned this book three times: uh, Technical Analysis of Stock Trends by Edwards and McGee. Even though it's about almost an inch and a half to two inches thick, and there's a lot to learn, is the Bible of technical analysis. If you want to learn basic technical analysis patterns and how to interpret them, read that book. If you want to know how to apply it in day-to-day, in day-to-day um, uh, in your day, in your day -day trading, come to my site or to your site because we're two of the best, okay? Mm -hmm. And, and I, I just really feel like um, spending a couple months in my site with the first 20 days for free, it costs you nothing, no credit card, by the way, Come in to thetechtrader.com, click on free trial, uh, ask for a 20-day free trial, and you'll get one. Yeah, you've got um, that link posted up right there on the home screen. You guys could see it right there, and it's also in the chat. Just make sure you, you know go there. It's right on the main of the website. But um, but like I always say, you got to learn before you can earn. You know what I mean? What The one thing I want to leave you with is a story, um, if you have time. We um, love stories. Well, um, this is a great story because it's my favorite story, and I tell us that almost every – um, seminar that I put on. It's, it's called Greed. 
M Michael uh, Douglas said, uh, greed is good. I don't think so. I said greed's bad. I was saying oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, but uh, here I am. Um, it's 1999. Uh, I had bought this stock called DNA, which was supposedly they had a, a new internet server that was 10 times faster than anything. And the stock, which I had originally bought at 17 through, because one of my institutional clients asked me about it. Uh, I paid, and then I bought more margin at 27, at 47, and at 60. Okay. Until I had 5,000 shares at an average of 35. And um, based on my institutional clients' request, take a look at the chart, tell me where you think it's going. I drew my lines across the top of the channel and said 120. 120? He goes, How's it going to 120? The stock was just 10 bucks. I said, 120 is my target. So what did I do? I put a 5,000 share order to sell at 120. So I'm in Hawaii on the beach. It's three o'clock in the morning. I call my broker because then there's no even an internet really. I'm not, I'm not yet. There wasn't over. It wasn't online trading anyway. I, call, I said, "Where is it?" He said, "It just opened at 103." I go, um, "And where's it now?" It's 108. And it's offered at 110. I and I have I have an end at 120. He goes, "Yeah." I said, "Raise it to 125." Mm. Now think of the logic behind this. I have a stock at an average of 35. It's tripled, and I want five more points. Now that's greed. That's greed. Yeah. Guess what the all-time high on that stock was that day? 120. To the penny. And it traded 17,000 shares there, and I, I would have got out of all of it. Right. Instead, the next day, I was stopped out at 93, and it went down to nothing. It literally, within a year, was was out of business, and the stock was zero. You got out at 93? 93. You, you, listen, at the end of the day, you're lucky you got out at 93. Well, no, you know I had a stop. That's because I had a stop loss in. Right. It okay. went down so fast, it went through me like, like a knife through butter. <laughs> but that's the story about greed. You really have to be disciplined and make sure you have stops and keep raising your stops every time. Look, that's another thing people forget. If the stock keeps going up, stay in it. Just keep raising your stops. Eventually, it'll either be stopped out or it'll go up so crazy, you'll, you'll say, I've had enough. I'm selling it. You know, sell, sell, the, sell the spike. Also, sell the news. Buy the bad news. Sell the good news. You know, it's, you know, it's funny. Um, we, I, We've all experienced what you experienced. I went through that too, and my traders done it. We did it. It happened to us uh, about three years ago. We traded the stock of when uh, the Trump stock went public. Okay. Yeah, you too, yeah. Yeah, and the thing went from it started at ten dollars, and we're looking at it, and I didn't even go in public until that that morning. And we had an onsite class that was going on here, and some of the students are that are listening and didn't know what I'm talking about because they were here, and all of a sudden, the thing went from like went from ten, and then went to like. $18. I'm like, Oh my God. So, you know, you know what it is. You do it. Look in the same way I'm looking, looking at big percentage gainers and so on goes to 30 goes to 40. The end of the day was, I closed at like $45, some crap. And I'm like, and then obviously, you know, the whole, everyone's talking about it. And it's all over the news and everything that stock that next day went to $150. All right. And we were just kicking ourselves in the ass because a lot of us, I, I held a small position of it, you know, but we, you know, obviously, you know, Whatever goes up that fast comes down twice as fast. So from like 45, it went to like 150. And we're in the pre-market. And a lot of people don't know this. You can't, you can get out in the pre-market if you got direct access. So we're getting out. A thing dropped to like $90 and we have a stop order. We couldn't get out of it. And um, I mean, it, and then like within a day or so, it went all the way back down to like, I don't know, hover around like 30. You know what I mean? But um, but you said right, you know, the same thing. Sometimes greed kills you and you learn from that. And it's gonna happen to all of us. You just got to know how to survive and not get, you know, be greedy again. Um, you're going to hit home runs, but you got to focus on base hits. That's exactly correct. Yeah. But Harry, thank you so much for coming here. And I really appreciate it, taking the time and talking to everyone. And, uh, you know, like I said, look forward to having you on again. It's always nice to have somebody that trades very similar like me, but been doing it 20 more years, even earlier. And it's good to see that. And really nothing really hasn't changed that much other than technology and so on, but the style is the same. And uh, I don't think anyone here should be scared to kind of like take a shot. So please try to get in, try to get in Harry's room, check it out, see how, see how it goes. Because listen, if you've been around this long, you're obviously doing something right, right, Harry? Well, not, not just that, but it, it literally costs you nothing, not even a credit card, to come in for free for 20 days. And a lot of my people tell me, by the way, the vast majority of people that, that, that come in who stay in and focus and come in in the morning and see the value of the room stay a long time. And but you can make enough money just in the 20 days to pay for one or two years of, of subscriptions because it's relatively cheap. So anyway, well, pl please come in and join us. See what we're all about and, and, and enjoy the profits.
Thanks, Harry, for coming. Everyone, appreciate it. And look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. We have Trader County coming on tomorrow for the next podcast. We'll see you then. Harry, thanks so much, everybody. Great being here. Thanks for inviting me.